Any electric vehicle, this is a simple subsystem layout that is uh, made for easier understanding. Okay, so just to give an analogy for those uh, coming from non-electrical background, I would like to just give an analogy with uh, the chariot and the chariot uh, owner. You know, when the, with the chariot uh, is nothing but the horses that is being driven. Uh, it could be the motor is nothing but the horses of the chariot. Okay, the motor is nothing but those are the working horses. It, it, it is the main uh, machine or some component that is used for moving the vehicle and uh, same as the horses that are used in the chariot. And the power modulator is nothing but a controller that is actually directing how the motor should uh, work, which is nothing but the chariot driver over there. The driver is now one who is actually allowing or managing the horses in such a way that the chariot can move ahead. So. Just to give a simple analogy, that's how I could think of in the morning so that uh, for non-electrical or non-EV people, this will be very useful in understanding how, what these components are. So, as... Uh, 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 dear sir, I think uh, uh, the audience are putting in the chat box that the voice is a little bit low. I think... Uh... Yeah, uh, let me just come ahead a little bit. And is it, is it any better? I have uh, good signal. Is it better now? Is it any better or is it still? Uh, yeah, yeah. For me, it is all right, sir. But I am seeing in the chat box as well as in the WhatsApp group, they are telling that the voice is low. I think uh, audience, please uh, uh, raise your uh, uh, maybe volume. It then better, it will be all right. Uh, Ajmanisha. Yeah, for me, it is absolutely all, all right. Yeah. So please raise the volume in your speaker so that uh, you can get it. Yes. Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Can someone else uh, confirm whether the voice is audible apart from Ajmunisha? I hope maybe that's probably with the speakers. Anybody among the students? The participants? So, Mahesh, uh, how do you feel, Mahesh, now? Or? Sir, it is audible, sir. Yeah, please, please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, as we discussed, so the motor is the working horse of the electric vehicle, which is the primary component, and the controller or the motor controller is the one that's actually used for uh, um, controlling the motor in such a way that the vehicle can move ahead uh, as required. So today's uh, topic, let's uh, now discuss more on the electric motors, and uh, these are the various uh, uh, main uh, topic that we will be covering under the. Uh, motor uh, electric motors. So we'll just go through the introduction, operating principle, and then we'll understand how the motor will work within uh, within the. I mean, what is the operating principle behind the motor? And we'll look at various uh, types of motors. We'll look at their characteristics, uh, and then we will see what is the difference among these two these types of motors, and then we'll conclude on this particular electric motor. So that's the overview for you on. Uh, uh, various subtopics that will be covered in the electric motors. So just to give again an introduction on the motors. So the what is motor? A motor is a, a machine that actually converts the electrical energy to mechanical energy. It takes electrical energy from the battery and it converts to mechanical energy that can be used for, uh, for, the, for the vehicle to move ahead. So just to give a comparison with the IC engines in an IC engine, you have a chemical energy that is actually stored in uh, either in a petrol form or in a diesel form or even in the CNG form. So the chemical energy is stored on the vehicle that's actually converted into thermal energy and then a force is created using the IC engines. Whereas in a motor, the electrical energy is stored in the form of a battery on the vehicle and that's actually converted into magnetic energy through the motor controller and the motor. And then uh, the force is created on the output of the motor that is used for uh, transporting the vehicle. So that's the basic uh, introduction of the vehicle. And if you look at various applications of motors in an electric vehicle, we may be always looking at uh, the primary application that's attraction, but uh, that's not the only uh, purpose of the motor in the vehicle. Apart from traction, there are auxiliary components and auxiliary systems. For the uh, design as well. So, auxiliary motors include the power steering motors. These are available in conventional IC engines as well. Brake air compressor is uh, for the brake air applied using compressor. Um, then you have a ca cabin air conditioning system that will have a compressor or uh, the blowers in some cases. So, these compressors and blowers are also run by motors. 
and then uh, battery thermal systems uh, especially for the cooling that includes the compressor for chiller fans or pumps so these may or may not be available but these are the various auxiliary applications depending upon the vehicle type configuration two wheeler three wheeler size of the battery sizing of the uh, thermal system so it all it might vary but to give a general overview these are the various auxiliary systems that you may be seeing in the vehicle so apart from that uh, cooling systems you will also have some box uh, uh, motors which is uh, wipers or power windows that we are also seeing in a conventional ic vehicle so these are the various uh, uh, loads that are available on the vehicle and an electric vehicle to be specific where these uh, um, motors are useful for doing various functionalities in order to have a smooth ride so other applications let's also see other applications because just to see uh, get to overview of motors these are there right from 1960 onwards more than 100 years old technology and they are used in many other applications so so they can be classified mainly into various types based upon the power rating as you can see largest was there a question someone is asking a question i can hear some okay maybe some disturbance uh, um, just pass me if some if someone has a question otherwise we can have a separate uh, question and answer uh, so that the uh, content can be covered in the stipulated time um, so the largest is nothing but uh, about 100 megawatt range so which is used uh, mainly in the marine oil and gas pump storage even the uh, di different industrial applications uh, primarily medium includes uh, nothing but the industrial fans blowers and pumps uh, which is sub 100 mega less than 1 megawatt range so that's a medium and small is nothing but what we see in our uh, household appliances uh, that could include your uh, mixer mixer geyser or even the, uh, not the geyser mixer power tools robots or wheelchairs some household appliances which are less than kilowatt uh, application and tiny is nothing but this drives and watches where you see a small tiny even the micro watts or mini watts uh, of uh, motors that are actually running in a very small components or electronic components as you can see so these are the various applications of motors so and this is a very proven technology for other applications and the same thing we are inheriting for the electric vehicle uh, that we are going to see in this particular uh, presentation today so let's look at the operating principle. I know so I hope you, uh, you guys have very good understanding on this, but let me just quickly break it for the for those who may not be aware. Uh, so it's based upon the Fleming's left hand rule. Uh, based upon Fleming's left hand rule, what it says is if a conductor is placed in a magnetic field, and if a current carrying conductor is placed in a magnetic field, then the force will be absorbed on the uh, on the conductor. So this is the uh, very simple understanding and the direction of the force is actually perpendicular to both the direction of current flow and also to the magnetic field so that's the uh, idea so you are sent you are giving electrical energy to the conductor and you are actually placing this conductor in a magnetic field and then you are seeing a force on this particular conductor and that's how you are getting it let's look at this animation uh, here as you can see, this is a magnet uh, with the north to south, and you can see the magnetic field. And this is a copper coil that is actually connected in a, in a coil shape, as you can see. And when you can, when the current is actually flowing, the force, you can see the force direction is given in this particular uh, arrow. So the, uh, based upon that force, then the coil will start actually spinning, and that force can be used for uh, uh, various load applications. So that's the basic principle, operating principle of a motor. And let's look at a typical motor construction. Um, these are the major components of a motor. As you can see, the majorly the stator. Stator is nothing but the stationary part of the motor which doesn't rotate or move. And that will normally have a stator coils, as you can see, the copper winding coils over here. And the second major component is the rotor, as you can uh, see, which is uh, having a shaft. And uh, this is the component that. Uh, you, that will be rotating spinning uh, when the magnetic field and the electric field are applied then this is the shaft that will be rotating and the load can be connected to the shaft here apart from these major components other significant component is a cooling system it could be a fan it could be a liquid cooling system with a heat exchanger it doesn't matter so there could be a cooling fan uh, for uh, other components which are primarily important to remove the heat from this particular motor so various uh, um, components within the motor as you can see here 
and if you if you look at uh, yeah uh, the assembly wise uh, the stator will be constructed separately and the rotor will be constructed separately and then it will be inserted and uh, into the motor for the for you should understand so that you will under, uh, you will get why why the motor rotates uh, along the uh, the rotor rotate Animation over here shows phase A, phase B, phase C currents. As you can see, they are uh, 120 degrees phase shifted. And when you have a result, field that will be rotating in the in the stator, it will be rotating. Uh, um, is the one that will help to induce uh, or to uh, to magnetic field and the stator magnetic field you will so let's look at quickly on the types of uh, various types of motors majorly classified into dc motors ac motors and uh, within dc motors you have uh, brushless or brush type of motors and then you have series shunt or Compound of permanent magnet types of motors under DC motors. Whereas in AC motors, majorly uh, synchronous and uh, induction type of machines, 85 percentage of the machines in the world are induction machines. So, induction machines are so good uh, in, in terms of maintenance and cost. So, they are primarily used for many applications around the globe. Whatever is being manufactured, 80 to 85 percentage is induction machines. So, let's quickly look at uh, various uh, motors and their characteristics for better understanding. And before we move to that, uh, let us also see, as we discussed in the operating principle, we need two fields. Uh, one field on the stator or on the other one is on the rotor field based upon the placement of the coils or the permanent magnets. So, these two fields, how they are generated in various types of machines is, is, is given here. For a DC, a DC motor, the magnetic field is created by the stator winding and electric field is created by the rotor winding. So similarly, you can see for brushless DC motors in such case, the permanent magnets are installed on the rotor that is actually creating the magnetic field. And when we that, as we discussed, there will be a uh, force on the machine and that will be used for, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the load, uh, for driving the load. So similarly, for induction machine, synchronous machine, we can quickly uh, look at uh, various uh, uh, fields how they are being generated. We will uh, go in detail in each type of machine in the, in the view of time. So a typical uh, construction of a one rotor DC motor, you can see this is a uh, four pole motor as you can see one this is one pole pair and this is another pole pair. I, I hope you can see my cursor this is one pole pair and this is another pole pair. So it's a four pole machine and the field winding is uh, generated because of this uh, uh, energization of this particular coils. And the rotor, you can see uh, the shaft, and over the shaft, you have the iron core and the coils that are actually wanted here. And there are ball bearings and other uh, things that are required for the uh, for actually interfacing between the stator and the rotor. With the moving surface and the, and the stationary surface, we need these ball bearings to be able to help us. So that's a major uh, construction overview of a DC motor. And if you look at uh, uh, the types of motor in another classification, that is axial and the uh, radial flux machines. So this is a, a very simple difference is the flux direction. Based upon the flux direction, you can also classify radial flux or axial flux. The difference is radial flux, your uh, flux direction will be actually perpendicular to the shaft. The shaft is the one that is actually connected to the load. So if the uh, flux direction is perpendicular, they are called radial flux machines. And if the flux is actually in uh, 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 in parallel to the shaft, as you can see the flux directions here, which are So most of the machines in the uh, usage are radial flux machines, be it induction or uh, permanent magnet or whatever the machine we, we talk about. There are axial flux machines that are also uh, coming up into the, uh, I mean, a lot of research is happening on the actual flux machines because of the density, power density. They can be called, uh, they can be 
manufactured at a lower uh, volumes and this will actually help in a, in an application like an electric vehicle in a two wheeler or a four wheeler where you have very little space to work and maybe not for industrial application where you have enough space but in certain applications where the space is a constraint these actual fax machines will be use, uh, useful but there are few challenges with actual fax machines as well which the industry is working on uh, and the cooling system for the rotor so there are uh, works going on research working uh, going on the actual fax machines in that direction so let's uh, quickly look at uh, yeah, i'm just going on uh, to the important slides so that we can spend time on that so there is uh, yeah two another type of classification is based upon uh, the rotor whether it is outside the uh, stator or inside the stator so it's based upon the location you have different types of uh, rotor uh, that are available most of the applications uh, that will be requiring the rotor inside and the stator is will be outside but yeah there are few uh, uh, critical applications where that will be required the rotor to be on the outside as well. Okay, so let's quickly go to the next slide on the spiral quage induction motors. This is how the uh, a typical induction machine uh, looks like. As the name indicates, the induction machine works based upon the principle of induction, electromagnetic induction. So you normally have on the rotor one winding and the stator, you have a stator winding. So when the stator winding is excited uh, and an EMF is induced on the stator windings because of this electromagnetic induction uh, between the stator and the rotor, these, these machines are called induction machines. And now once the current, is, when an EMF is generated on the winding and the winding is short circuited with the end, end coils, uh, the, the current will be flowing in this rotor winding and thereby creating a rotor uh, electromagnetic field and stator electromagnetic field interaction will give you the torque uh, required for, for driving the load. So that's the major uh, working principle of an induction machine and you can see different uh, yeah, end rings. These are the end rings that are used for short and when these end rings are connected then the current direction will be you can see <coughs> excuse me for a minute yeah so There will be a current that will be actually flowing in these coils and that will create the rotor magnetic field. So, and the synchronous speed uh, uh, for the rotor magnet uh, is given by, for the rotating magnetic field is given by the formula. To you can see that is in the edge or uh, RPM. So, uh, well, sorry, depending upon the speed, whether it is in v, uh, RPM or RPS, this is just formula. 120 F by P for RPM and 2 F by P for RPS. And uh, the synchronous, uh, uh, synchronous speed is the speed at which the rotating magnetic field will be rotating inside the um, uh, motor. And because of this in, uh, uh, induction principle, the motor rotor will be rotating at a slip speed, which is, uh, which is a little slower than the synchronous speed. And uh, that is given by the formula NS, uh, NS minus N by N. Uh, this is and the y axis is the torque in this particular case and you can see the maximum torque is applied when the slip is uh, when the slip is between 0 to 0 0.1 you will see the maximum torque and about the uh, about that slip it will be the torque that can be generated by the machine is will be reduced so that's in the forward motoring uh, um, position and if you are, you can also go for forward braking wherein the Torque is reversed uh, when you apply when you when the rotor is rotated in the opposite direction by changing the rotating magnetic field, you will be able to go to the forward braking mode as well. So that's the characteristics of the induction machine. And uh, let's look at the various uh, important points related to the induction machine. Uh, of the motors uh, that are manufactured are induction machines. And when compared to DC motors, they are lightweight, small volume, low cost, high efficiency. So robustness is the one that is actually uh, industries because they are they need low maintenance. They are reliable. They don't fail uh, as uh, um, as it, as other machines. So that's why these are these machines are used in various uh, mission, various applications. Let's let magnets in motors briefly. 
So two types of uh, permanent magnet motors, uh, depending upon the position of the permanent magnet. If the permanent magnets are placed on the surface of the rotor, as you can see, the inner circle, gray circle, is the one that's uh, the rotor, and the other one is a stator. The gray uh, outer one is a stator. So on the rotor surface, you can see these yellow bars, which are nothing but the permanent magnets, which are uh, mounted on the surface of this particular. Um, uh, rotor, they are called as surface magnet, mounted permanent magnets. Whereas, if the magnets are actually inserted in, uh, in, into the rotor core, then they are called as uh, interior uh, permanent magnets, uh, which is uh, which is also widely used because of the mechanical advantage. You these uh, permanent magnet machines, which are permanent magnets, which are actually on the surface, will have uh, some. Uh, majorly because of at high speeds you will not be able to achieve because these have to be properly sticked onto the surface and you may have some challenges when you are running at uh, in terms of in terms of the me mechanical uh, design that's a challenge so at higher speeds interior permanent magnets are used because they are actually inserted into, into the core and there is a uh, very good uh, 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 very good uh, um, construction for the permanent magnets and they will not fly away like unlike in the case of a permanent magnet uh, surface mounted machines. Let's look at the brief of uh, uh, features of uh, PMSM machines. Yeah, they are high efficient. Uh, there is no energy loss for excitation there since because you have on the permanent magnets uh, on the rotor. So you don't need to have a separate uh, circuit for energizing unlike in a regular synchronous machines. So that's a high efficient one. And as we go, uh, as we as there is a lot of research going on in terms of getting high energy density magnets uh, with using rayleigh metals. So they are a fact You can get higher magnetic fields. Thereby, you you need uh, so better dynamic response. Higher magnetic field uh, density in air caps. So these machines are very good at uh, uh, having a dynamic response, and that's uh, very. Uh, much required for the industrial applications as well. High efficiency over uh, wide operating range. This is the major major uh, driving factor for most of the uh, most of the industry, especially electric vehicle industry, to look into PMS emissions because they are very high efficient and any energy that is saved on on the design will be used for extra mileage on the vehicle, and that's a one one significant factor for the electric vehicle. Application so permanent magnets that's that's where it is scoring high when compared to other machines. Ease of cooling yeah there's no rotor losses especially so apart from the uh, core losses you don't have many uh, uh, you don't have a winding that will actually generate the losses so it's easy for cooling and the compact is uh, compactness is uh, achieved as well and uh, yeah low maintenance when compared to brushed DC and long duty and less less noise as well. On the con side, uh, PMS emissions are expensive because of the permanent magnets that are used. And since these are rare earth metals, availability is a challenge and supply chain challenges are there. But uh, industry is working on uh, identifying alternate ways of uh, permanent magnet uh, combinations. And uh, right now, uh, uh, apart from the expensive um, uh, feature of this PMS emission, the, uh, there's also limited constant power range. You can't go beyond certain level of uh, power. And because the rotor magnetic field is always present once it is installed, uh, any movement on the rotor will create an uh, electric voltage uh, on the stator winding. So towing, uh, we need to be very careful. How do we? plan for the sewing in such a case we have to plan and also risk of demagnetization is there when the permanent magnets worn out then the entire machine has to be has to be uh, removed and replaced so that's the risk of demagnetization spms yeah, as we discussed it cannot be run at high speeds but we have ipms um, the position feedback is important as well so uh, induction machines for uh, various applications without uh, encoders you will be able to work but uh, since these are synchronous uh, 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 so there are uh, other types of uh, SRMs, uh, which is nothing but as well as reluctance machines, where the permanent magnets is actually installed on the rotor in such a way that, as you can see, these are the flux barriers on the rotor. 
there are flux barriers and uh, the flux is uh, uh, designed in such a way that the flux will only be going into this uh, into this part uh, not onto the other one because of the air gap you have this uh, flux uh, part because of created of the structure of the, due to the structure of the rotor core so the flux will be actually going only into this part so uh, and if you insert a magnet then the flux will be further multiplied or magnified and then you get a better flux the advantage with the SRM is because it is drugged and low cost. It will be achieved with a low cost. I mean, if you, if, I mean, even with the, without the permanent magnet, as you can see, um, uh, with the, uh, that will lead to cost. If you remove even the flux can go into the rotor by using this rotor, rotor course structure. Uh, these are low cost and high efficiency for a speed range. So these are the benefits. So which the industry is also looking at the SRM machines that can be used for electric vehicle application. There are certain challenges related to the high torque uh, ripple because uh, you have a gap between the, uh, as you can see, between the flux paths, you can have a gap. And so because of the gap, you, you get high torque ripple and that results to vibration and noise. So uh, there are uh, challenges also on the power density and that's why uh, the magnet, thermal magnetic uh, uh, bars are introduced for improving the density but still the advantage with this type of SRM machines is they are rugged and low cost and there are disadvantages on the torque uh, ripple and the control uh, philosophy that's the reason these SRMs are not widely used but a lot of research is happening on the SRM machines to be used so in general uh, this is how a motor uh, characteristic curves will look like uh, top speed characteristics and let us see the major important the critical points that are re required while we size the machine for electric vehicle. So these are the important points that we need to know. The maximum speed is nothing but the, uh, as you can see from the curve, you can infer from this particular curve, this is the magnetic uh, maximum speed at which the machine can run without, uh, without, uh, um, yeah, without damage, without any damage to the rotor or to the machine, without any damage based upon the supplier to supplier, we get this is the maximum speed. And the maximum torque point is nothing but the torque that can be generated usually at the lower speeds. So the torque will be very, the torque that can be achieved by the machines are very high. That's called the maximum torque point. And base speed is nothing but the point at which the, uh, the torque uh, uh, the torque can be maximum and at the maximum speed as well as the speed. So at this point of speed, the torque can be maintained and afterwards the torque will stop, uh, will reduce as you can see as you increase the speed. So till this point of base speed, the maximum torque can be achieved. It depends upon the motor uh, uh, to motor, but yeah, this is a we, uh, base speed point at which the torque will drastically start reducing. And continuous torque and uh, speed is nothing but any operating point under this curve is called continuous torque and speed point. So, so depending upon the load, you can probably op operating at this particular point here or uh, you have a very big load and because of a big uh, ramp you may be up, you may be operating at this point of uh, curve so it can change it can change the continuous torque and speed points is the one that the machine can operate without any uh, impact or uh, degradation on the thermal behavior and duration of peak torque and power so if this peak torque and peak power and normally will have uh, a certain limit uh, beyond which it cannot operate so otherwise the thermal uh, stability issue will happen so the, the manufacturer will usually define what is the duration of uh, peak torque and power and until which we thought the system can work performance of attraction motors when compared to an induction machine so that definitely uh, we can't use an induction industrial motors that are available in the industry directly for attraction because uh, these traction motors, it is highly Unlike in industrial motors, once you decide, okay, it's a transmission, you select as one, and then you go ahead, that's it, it will be all operating in place. But in case of attraction, you will be operating sometimes it will be periodic, sometimes it will be acceleration, deceleration. So the duty cycles will be varied. It's not the same uh, duty cycles unlike seen in industrial machines. So 
uh, we can't directly derive. So these uh, duty cycles have to be considered while designing the traction machine uh, so that it can perform without uh, uh, without uh, reliable issues on the on the vehicle. And uh, form factor and power density, yeah. Uh, usually industrial machines are standard frame size per kg is also acceptable because they have enough uh, space within the within the mill, uh, cold roll mill, hot strip mill, or even uh, solar uh, um, solar auxiliary applications or even wind, for example, uh, we have enough space within the turbine. So, but in in this case, in the traction machines, uh, uh, except buses where there is enough space, uh, other especially two wheelers and four wheelers will may not have enough space. So, form factor is the one that is also critical. So, we'll have to be very careful about the size availability, and there is no standard frame sizes because it all depends upon how the vehicle is packaged. So, and there is a key requirement of 5 kW per kg. And efficiency classes in industry, it is quite uh, uh, stable and it is almost uh, this uh, standard governs what is the uh, efficiency range as well. But uh, traction motors, there is no such standard yet. But yes, the, uh, the industry expectation is high efficiency or high uh, speed range. Input power, yeah, uh, there are minor changes. You will have LV, HV, and high tension as well, depending upon what voltage you are operating. Uh, industry it is more, more, more or less uh, it is 12 volt to 800 volts uh, DC or AC applications also is available just to give a comparison it is given and cooling is also common and operating temperature range is another deviation which is a uh, very high weight uh, range and uh, maybe as an industry machine it may not be it is ambient uh, but in, the, in case of a traction motor in electric vehicle depending upon the package space and the surrounding components such as gearbox and other tires and other uh, uh, other heat uh, gel dissipating components, the operating temperatures may be high. So these are the various uh, differences between uh, traction motors and induction motors and accordingly uh, it has to be sized. On that various operating principles and the features of the machines, let us motors in terms of the parameters as given here. So power density, as you can see, PM motor is the one that is going to uh, do very uh, good scoring here on the power density. And then reluctance motors with the permanent magnets assisted will be scoring even higher. But uh, permanent magnetic motion, motor and compact induction machines and these machines are scoring better. Peak efficiency, again, as you can see in the numbers here, uh, permanent magnetic motor scores high when compared to other uh, machines. And, this is the critical factor that is actually used. Uh, same as load efficiency, it is a uh, wide operating based upon the operating speed, it will vary. But uh, since the efficiency is high, this is one significant factor that is it's used for selecting the uh, selecting in the electric vehicle application. Controllability, yes, uh, though it is uh, hard for field weakening zone, there are a lot of uh, control algorithms available now, it is no more. Uh, challenge for controlling a permanent magnetic machine, but uh, it's also relatively permanent magnetic machines are uh, easier when compared to other machines. Reliability is good and the heat uh, sinkable or the speed ratios are also good when compared to other machines. And uh, size and weight is also another factor. This can be achieved with this permanent magnetic machines. High speed performance is also better. It can be achieved with the internal permanent magnets on the on the rotor. High speed can be achieved, and the performance, uh, especially on the efficiency or the dynamic response, is even better for the permanent magnet machines. Construction is uh, compact, and the cost is uh, uh, relatively high when compared to induction machines. But uh, the cost is not so high and uh, not so not so far in order to adapt. And uh, controller cost is more or less same, and uh, combination is also okay. So various uh, parameters are considered by the industry, and what we feel is this: uh, permanent magnetic machines are going to uh, do a game changer for these electric vehicle applications. Unless electric machines, if they can come up, uh, they can also be used uh, with uh, other, because more or less PM motor and the electric motors with permanent magnet assisted uh, will have similar properties, and if the cost can, factor can be improved with the reluctance motor, then definitely this will be used by the industry going ahead and there is a lot of success happening on this area. So on that uh, note, let's uh, look at, quickly go on motor control. Uh,
some of the various topics that we cover introduction we'll look at the various control uh, strategies we we'll look at what is uh, an inverter and fun functionalities of an inverter and, uh, and then we will conclude so that's a major topic so as we have seen this picture earlier so motor controller is nothing but the, uh, the inverter and the controller together is called motor controller for the electric vehicle in the electric vehicle technology so let's look at the various functionalities of the so the major objective is to invert the power inversion so you need to invert the dc power from the battery to ac power for the power magnet machines or induction machines so you need to invert the power dc to ac so that's why that's the one functionality under which you have input uh, smoothening by capacitors so you smoothen them and then you normally have a switching devices that are used for this power inversion which will which will uh, go in detail in the later part of the presentation so we have gear drivers for controlling the uh, switching devices and then and then the feedback sensors are also required for achieving this power inversion and another important factor is the control or the controller itself which will have the controller will have the field oriented control or the control uh, uh, topology that will be available within the within the controller algorithm and you have the space vector for generating the reference points and then the um, and then the phase angle you have the various pwm strategies on switching frequencies that will be generated within the controller board and then we have the advanced algorithm such as optimum loss uh, uh, generation algorithm which can reduce the losses due to the harmonics and uh, various other advanced algorithms are also can be used within the control concept and other types of interface is nothing but uh, you cooling you you have cooling requirement for both the battery uh, sorry for the power uh, motor controller and the motor the cooling interface and also user interface i was in some cases uh, you may have the vehicle may or the driver may have to interact directly with the motor or the motor controller especially motor controller you will have a user interface i was where it is interfacing and the typical communication interfaces includes uh, it could be an external communication via can to the vehicle controller and the vehicle master controller or can it can, uh, it can communicate internal it could be within the uh, inverter uh, from the controller board to the various gate drivers you may have a custom the communications it can be custom and uh, you you have an interface especially with an external sensor from between the motor and the motor controller so that's an encoder interface apart from these functionalities you also have and such and hvl is the interlock for the safety of hv system so these are the various functionalities under the uh, motor controller uh, system so under scalar control it is uh, just a regular vbf control areas under vector control it is uh, quite complicated and uh, when compared to scalar control in terms of understanding but yes there are different uh, vector controls such as direct torque control field oriented control and there are some other advanced control methods but majorly industry is looking at uh, field oriented control which is used in different uh, industry not just electric vehicle but in different industries field oriented control is used and some of the appliances some of the systems are also using direct torque control so just to give an a uh, difference a comparison between a scalar control and vector control scalar control is like an open door control you don't look at the output of the system you just apply and you don't have any control you don't try to control the output you just give the reference without looking at the output whereas in vector control you is normally a closed loop system so the you know you can have a precise control on the input and uh, we will we will look at the in detail on the vector control uh, how it works in the next few slides so again under direct torque control you have various advanced algorithms uh, which we will not go right away but just for your reference yes there are different types of uh, uh, control strategies uh, that are available in the literature and uh, the systems uh, 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 and are in, uh, are inheriting these uh, uh, algorithms over a period of time let's go ahead uh, i don't know why is that stop here
uh, seen the DC motor how they work. Let's look at how the control is uh, happening in the DC motor, especially with the uh, with the system, the separately excited systems, as you can see here. So this is the armature uh, which is on the rotor, and uh, this is the field winding which is on the stator. So here in this case, your armature and uh, your field windings are different. So there are two different circuits, and you need to energize them separately. So uh, if you want to have a control on the torque of the machine then you control the current that is actually flowing in the armature winding. As you can see by this equation, torque is proportional to the armature current. So you want to control the torque on the machine for the for various loads, then you control the armature uh, voltage and indirectly uh, in, in you get a uh, current, controlled current. So you have a direct relation between the torque and the armature current. So in order to control the torque, you control the armature. And in case of a uh, speed, if you want to control the speed, the speed is given by this formula which is inversely proportional to the flux and if you control the field winding current, uh, then the flux will vary and when the flux varies, then the speed will vary. So here, as you can see, you can have it can be controlled separately, field can be controlled separately. So decoupled relation between the torque and speed. So both of them can be independently controlled and these are some curves. Which say sort of the constant torque region, power region, <coughs> which we will anyway uh, come to this at a later point of time. But the crux point or the key takeaway from this slide is that in the DC mode, but when you look at the AC motor, the AC motor torque is given by this formula where it is depending upon both flux and also uh, the current IA. So it is, it is dependent upon both flux and current. So if you try to change the uh, torque, the speed will also change. So there is a uh, there is a, a direct uh, coupling between the torque and speed. So you can't control, you can't control the machine uh, independently. So you will not to have, you need to have some something like a vector control philosophy where you actually decouple the speed and torque relation so that you can control the torque and speed of the machine independently and that's what it is required. And uh, yeah, for the vector control, uh, this is one transformation that is required where in the three phase uh, currents are required. By transforming this, we will have an effect of decoupling, and that's why we are transforming them. And uh, Clark transformation is a transformation for three phase system to two phase system. So, this part transformation is from alpha beta stationary uh, rotating frame to a stationary reference frame that is DQ. So, uh, that's the transformation. And let's look at uh, in the real time how this is working. So, if you look at this. Uh, both of them are stationary and are time independent. As you can see with respect to the theta, uh, D and Qs are not changing various ADC or alpha beta are changing. So by having this D frame, and you are depending upon what is the angle component and D is a flex component. So when you convert this, you will be able to con control both the D and Q components separately, as you can see in this particular vector control uh, overview diagram. So you will have two control algorithms, one for the D component and which is nothing but the field controller and the other one is the torque controller. So you will be uh, controlling both field and torque separately and will be achieving the vector control. And the self concept modulation that is uh, normally used for, in, uh, for better understanding. So in this sinusoidal pulse width modulation, it is actually, uh, you can see uh, three phase reference waveforms that are generated, which are 120 degrees phase shifted. These overlap with the, with the carrier frequency, which is nothing but a triangular at a higher frequency. As you can see, this triangular waveform overlapped here. So at this intersection, based upon the V control is nothing but the 
uh, reference wave form. If it is above the triangular voltage, then you actually get VDC by 2 at the output. And if it is less than uh, V triangle, you will get minus VDC by 2. So sinusoidal pulse width modulation will actually uh, help in uh, generating the reference uh, gate pulses that will be required for uh, firing the inverter. And uh, space vector pulse width modulation is nothing but uh, uh, it's another way of representing the vector uh, control systems where you define the states based upon the uh, device that is turned on or turned off. Based upon the uh, top device or bottom device which is turned on, you can have V0 to V8. So when uh, when you have two, when you have different uh, vectors like this, uh, for, for example, if you're talking about uh, v, uh, V1 or V60 here, 0, 1, 1, which means uh, a phase is a phase top device is off, B phase uh, top device is on, C phase uh, top device is on. So when you have this configuration, then output voltage will be uh, will be with respect to this uh, angle. You will be uh, actually at uh, 60 degrees from the D axis. So that's why it is 60 degrees uh, V60. So if you want to, likewise, you will be able to achieve different vector states by turning on, turning off the top device and bottom device. So if you want to operate any operating point between these two vector states, then you can uh, we are working with majorly use space vector pulse width modulation because of the easy implementation in the digital domain. Now let's quickly uh, look at the power electronics part of it. I hope I have time. One second. Yeah. So power electronics introduction. For uh, power systems and uh, solid state electronics. The benefits that are seen in electronics, solid state electronics, are actually applied for power systems. You can see these diodes, uh, transistors, and the MOSFETs and FETs, trans BJTs are all used in uh, analog devices uh, on uh, signal circuit. And the, uh, the same benefits that were available there, but you, if you use it in power systems, they are far less power electronic systems. And it's And they control the flow of electrical energy using these uh, circuits from one form of energy to another form of energy. So what are the various forms of energy, AC and DC? So as you can self-explanatory, AC will be time varying, then DC is not time varying. So uh, let's look at various combination of conversions from um, one form of energy to another form of energy, as you can see in with this cycle. So when you convert uh, AC energy to DC energy, they are called using a power electronic component. They are called as rectifiers, AC power to DC. These are nothing but what you use in your uh, mobile phone charger or your UPS or, you know, these rectifiers are majorly used there. Where it is actually plugged to a, a 230 volt socket and you get a DC output using SMPS or any other type of rectifiers. Also. They are called generally rectifiers. And if you are actually converting from DC power to DC power, they are called as uh, choppers from one, usually from one level of voltage to another level of voltage. Uh, let's say in the case of an electric vehicle, uh, your DC bus voltage uh, can be as high as 500 volts, but your control circuit can be 12 volts. So you need a DC DC converter for, for this particular application. They are called choppers or DC DC converters. And if you are converting from DC to AC, they are called as inverters. So you uh, they are usually used in the uh, inverter applications which we use, uh, solar inverters or wind uh, in some cases as well. They are called inverters when they convert DC to AC. And if you are converting AC to AC, they are called as uh, cyclo converters, uh, usually from one uh, Uh, used uh, which are for converting from one form of energy to other form of energy. Let's uh, look at in uh, general and also the controller. We will have an input from a source and it will have a load. In case of an electric vehicle, you have a battery pack and it is usually DC and the loads can be a DC or it can be also AC. So, uh, what are the various DC loads on an electric vehicle? You can have a DC DC converter, which we have seen. On AC loads, it could be an inverter for the HVAC unit or for a chiller compressor. 
So it can be a uh, AC motor that will be running a compressor and that's in that case uh, an inverter will be used. So various applications are available. So let's look at the uh, various types of AC loads in the mix. Uh, breaker auxiliary application, steering application, HVAC, and then chiller uh, compressor. So various types of uh, AC loads are available and they need. So let's look at the various uh, types of inverters uh, quickly. So DC to AC uh, is the inverter. Majorly they are classified into current source inverter and voltage source inverter. What is the difference between a current source and voltage source? So the, the difference is uh, if the input to the inverter is a constant voltage, then it is called as uh, voltage source. If it is a constant current, it is called as current source. Uh, so in case of voltage source inverter, we usually see a capacitor which is actually trying to maintain a constant voltage. That's why they are called as voltage source inverters. And you can classify them into two level and multi level. Uh, in a two level case, it is uh, under two level, you usually have a simple circuit H pitch, which is the mostly used for uh, motor application. You can, you can usually use this patch or a grid connected systems. We prefer multi level inverters because of the better harmonic uh, content that will be generated by the inverter, which is uh, complying to grid compliances and all. We may go for multi-level uh, configurations under which you have different combinations and uh, this can be used in such an application where the THT harmonic content is uh, critical uh, for that particular load application, multi-level can be used. But unlike in a motor, motor itself is an inductor. Then uh, motor itself can we, we can use a two level inverter. Let's look at the configuration of the voltage source inverter in this diagram. So usually you will have a DC source with a capacitor in, 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 in the input, and and you have these uh, three edge bridge circuit. You uh, can see uh, a bottom device and top device with respect to the output load connection. This is the load connection A for the output. If the device is on the top, you call as top device. So when the top device is turned on, then you have the full voltage applied across the uh, top device in the combination with other winding as well. You will have the full voltage applied. If you are if you have the bottom device then on, then the output is connected to the negative, so you will have a zero output voltage. So that. Uh, uh, Yeah, two level and three level again. The top energy configuration. If you see uh, one top device in a two level, is the you have some small uh, diodes or capacitors depending upon diode clamp or flying capacitor. Depending upon various technology, you'll have an additional component that that is required for uh, smooth operation of the machine. But the crux here is one device is replaced with uh, two devices and uh, thereby you achieve uh, three levels in the output voltage. So the definition of two level or three level is how many levels of output voltage, uh, in the output, how many levels of voltage is available in an half cycle. So if you look at a two level inverter, you either see a zero voltage or VDC in a one half cycle, then this is called as two level inverter. And as you can see directly, we have a comparison between the nature rather than a two level, which is uh, which is not so much science order and may not be useful for many applications uh, except. The <coughs> if the turn turn off is uncontrolled, it's, you're not, you don't have a control circuit to control, they are called as uncontrollable devices. An example is diode. So based upon device will turn on or turn off. You don't have control both on turning on and turning off. They are called as uncontrollable devices. 
and uh, partially controllable is nothing but uh, you can control the turn on but not the turn off so it's something like a CF kayak and kayak based upon the load come they, they will turn off so they are partially controllable and you have a fully controllable devices such as BJT MOSFET as you can use where you can control both the turning on and turning off using a control circuit using a low voltage control circuit you will be able to control uh, how you want to turn on and how you want to turn on the devices so the devices are classified into this and uh, yeah so now that we have go gone through the both the motor and the controllers and the inverters uh, basic principle let's uh, let's look at uh, again this particular the torque speed control system which is used uh, uh, by um, which is given by many manufacturers of the motor and So the technologies you have seen base speed, uh, maximum speed, you have seen through. So and in case of DC is armature, voltage control, and uh, field control about the base speed. Uh, what is important here is uh, this torque speed characteristics. Uh, uh, you will normally have a peak torque speed characteristics, which means they will be operated only for a uh, certain period of time, usually 30 seconds or 20 seconds from manufacturer to manufacturer. So this peak torque is the one that is used for negating the vehicle when the vehicle is at a full weight and you have a certain uh, ramp, you know, could be climbing a hill. So you need to ensure that the peak torque that the machine can deliver is uh, sufficient enough uh, to uh, to overcome these two requirements, that is the both uh, uh, ramp requirements and starting torque. That's all you need to take care of. That's the meaning of this peak talk. And uh, the max speed is the one that is actually used for determining the maximum speed at which the vehicle can run. So you need to see if the design. Then you can uh, operate uh, even beyond that. If the motor can operate in, at this point, then the probably the vehicle you want to operate a little lower than that in order to ensure that the motor is not operated in the limits, you normally take a certain percentage lower than the maximum speed. So these are the two points, critical points I wanted to share here in order to, uh, when you are sizing it, you need to ensure both the restart of gradability and the continuous gradability is met by the maximum torque of the machine. And also the maximum speed of the machine is achieved or the maximum speed of the vehicle can be achieved by looking at the maximum speed of the motor. So that's the key points I wanted to give to the uh, team here. And also another critical point is uh, efficiency, as mentioned uh, earlier, it is, uh, the duty cycle is not constant, it is very highly random, highly variable, depending upon to driver to driver, the speed will be either given from, uh, you know, in terms of from the load of the vehicle. So the, these characteristics of the duty cycle are in order to have a common, uh, uh, in order to have a common uh, uh, understanding, usually the drive cycles will be defined, which will be defined for a two-wheeler, four-wheeler, by uh, or, a, or a bus, uh, drive cycles are usually defined so that the speed with respect to time we have some characteristics and based upon this we will analyze and we will have to compare from one manufacturer to other manufacturer so drive cycle is very critical as you can see the speed uh, is highly varying and uh, you need to ensure that uh, the drive cycle you know, the system is designed and also the efficiency is also uh, achieved uh, the during this uh, maximum operating point so we, once we select the drive cycle, which is uh, for a particular urban driving cycle or a highway driving cycle, depending upon the uh, vehicle type that we are going to choose. So if it is a, if it is usually a uh, intra-city vehicle, for example, a bus that is actually connecting from um, uh, between two major cities like Bangalore, Chennai, then you will be operating. We will be mostly operating in highway drivings, and you may have to choose a separate uh, motor. When compared to an urban driving, where you are actually within the within the city, which is within the city uh, city buses, for example, and they will be having a different cycle. So since the driving cycle is different, the operating behavior of the machines will be different, and the efficiencies will be different. So 
So understanding a dry cycle is very much critical in order to size the machine. So that's the difference. And let's look at one particular one before we close the session. So this is the dry cycle uh, uh, points, the dry cycle operating points. So when the top points, you can speak. two three hours you look at one operating speed and torque points these are the various torque points and let's say every one second you collect the data for two hours you have uh, thousands of data points and when you plot that speed operate speed torque uh, over here you can see most of the time the vehicle is operated in this particular zone which is uh, between 2000 4000 rpm and between 0 to 15 meter later so this will uh, vary from one vehicle to other vehicle so this has to be observed and we knew we it's nothing but the motor the transmission system and the higher efficiency if you look at the another uh, route if you, the bottom one is another the speed torque operating points are actually uh, displays they are not operating between 2000 to 4000 as seen here it is at the higher speeds which is usually a urban uh, sorry which is usually highway speed so the speeds are high and the torque is less so this is usually highway driving and this is usually a urban driving where the points are flattered and clustered so the the main takeaway here is most of the time in, in urban cycle There is an hybrid range cycle, it's usually higher space and is also mm. accordingly. We will have to see and select what uh, this is for a particular manufacturer. You can see the motor torque operating points, and you can see various forms in the efficiency of the machine. When operated, let's 20.5 and any, any operating point within this color zone, as you can see, the efficiency is uh, more or less. So you can you can get this contours, efficiency contours from the from the manufacturer, and you will know uh, which row which range it is higher. So this is from the motor manufacturer, and this is from the operating. This is the load characteristics. This is the character. Because you will know. So uh, this may not be directly one to one, but I'm just giving you for reference uh, here. So between 2000 to 5000 RPM, uh, the operating points is here. So if you just overlap this particular one to here, then I'm actually operating in 87.5 percentage efficient or 88 percentage point 88 or 84 percentage. So I'm actually operating my motor. I'm operating in this particular zone. So which may not be really. Uh, efficient because your high efficient region is somewhere here and your operating region is here. The vehicle range is better and the efficiency is, is good. So that's the key takeaway that I wanted to when we are integrating a machine to the electric vehicle. These are certain things that we need to take care especially for the traction system application. Okay, so on that brief note, I have questions. I hope I have covered the uh, major points that will be required for an industry in terms of sizing the machine and the motor controller. So I'm open for any questions now. Uh, good morning, Professor. Yeah, your Can voice you is a little low. Can you just be a little more audible? Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, please go on. Yeah, it was a, a good presentation given by you. We have almost uh, revised all the uh, topologies and machine uh, design concepts. Uh, my, uh, I have only one query to 
to be clear is that uh, in what way the drive cycle and uh, size of the machines are related, sir? In what way the size of the machine, uh, sorry, drive cycle and the machine uh, characteristics size. are related? Is that what your question? Machine, machine size, size. Size. Main dimensions of the machine, you can say maybe D, D and L, main dimensions of the machine related with the drive cycles. Okay. So let me just show that again. So this is the drive cycle that uh, we are actually uh, considering here. So drive cycle is nothing but the speed versus time. Speed versus time. So when the vehicle is operated at zero time until 14 seconds, how the speed is varying. So based upon the speed, the uh, based upon the uh, time, the speed will be varying. So you get a drive cycle. So uh, normally for various types of uh, vehicle routes, you define, uh, for example, in a case of a bus, we, we define it as Delhi bus driving cycle. So that's the driving cycle which will define how the speed speed will vary with respect to time. And that Delhi bus driving cycle will be used by all manufacturers in order to evaluate the performance of the system in terms of energy consumption, range. We will have to follow that particular driving cycle. So all of these uh, uh, manufacturers will be evaluated based upon that. So that's for the uh, for the bus. In case of a four-wheeler, we have a different uh, drive cycle that is called as WLTP, which is nothing but an, uh, a drive cycle the passenger car segments. So that will have another type of speed versus time characteristics. So these are different such that you, you can evaluate different manufacturers and a customer can evaluate, can understand that all of these uh, uh, components are tested at a particular operating conditions and then you can decide and you can compare one to one. That's the major reason for for the uh, importance of the drive cycle. And another important reason is to take this uh, drive cycle data points, not just the speed, if you collect the torque points and then overlap into this kind of an load characteristics. Now you know that the load or a particular route with that particular weight and with the particular driver you have the speed load top data points and you need to overlap this with the machine design. This is where you need to ensure that uh, your machine is actually sized in in uh, in line with the uh, load operating points. So the load operating points cannot be let's say here if you say if, if you take for, for example this is the characteristics of the machine and if I overlap and I find that my load operating points is always in this blue zone. I can't use this motor because this motor is having 60% uh, efficiency in that particular one. So you may have to use a separate type of machine or you have to change the transmission system and ensure that this region is overlapped to here. And then you get a higher efficiency of the system. So that's the reason why we need to take or consider the drive cycle pretty, pretty much in order to size the motor for that application. Uh, hope I have understood. Uh, hope I have understood your question in this way, and whether my question, whether my answer answers your question, or you still have another question. Uh, yes, sir. You have you have touched the uh, doubts we say as, but uh, when you come to the uh, design point of any machine, we used to say diameter D and L. Those two will decide the size of a machine, main dimensions of a machine. Uh -huh. Is there any? Is there any relation where D and L are related with the drive cycle? Not really, not really. It, it depends upon the type. It depends upon the type of the machine. And actually, we only take these characteristics. Uh, to some extent, maybe what I, I understand, to some extent, and I'm, I'm not trying to understand. Yeah, you, you, uh, okay, I got your question now. <coughs> yeah. So you have to size this uh, uh, machine in such a way that this operating region have to change from here to here. And what do you change? You have to change the entire either D or L and and that's uh, that is only possible. And also you have to change the material type as well. And that, that's how you get various combinations of uh, the speed operating points. And yes, uh, that is one, one significant factor is also to able to change the D and L in order to achieve this particular uh, operating region. Thank you, thank you.
Sir, good morning, sir. I am Dr. Nyanam Murthy, Anna University, Vilipram Campus, Tamil Nadu. My yes. question is, when you are uh, changing the vehicle, for example, if you the two-wheeler and uh, four-wheeler, the driving uh, cycle will be varying according to that. That, yes. that car, how you are find out that type of characteristics in this drive, sir? Okay, so typically we, in order to get the characteristics, we will have to do this uh, uh, with uh, with another IC engine only. We normally we, we are collecting because uh, automobile sector, we have lots of uh, dry cycle data points as you can see. These set of data points we have. So we know the weight of the system, we know the weight of the vehicle, we know the weight of the uh, and the gradient in which the vehicle is operated. So that we have different operating data points that is available for us. So we can collect that particular route, that particular weight of the system, and now we know the speed and torque. So speed and torque is nothing but uh, if you, let's say, the EVW is fixed, 18.5 uh, 18 ton or 19 ton for a, for a 12 meter bus. So that is fixed. So the speed load operating points will not change. So now that engine is operating uh, in such a way that you, you need to, of course, you need to see whether you are measuring at the RAR or you are measuring at the wheels. So you need to be very clear about that. So once you know you are measuring at the RAR and you have the data points are here, so we have this reference points. If we don't have this reference points, then we may not be able to size it uh, rightly. So let's, let's consider a system where there is no data. There is no data for this. Then at least we should know whether it is highway or an urban driving cycle. And then you will be able to, uh, you know, based upon the characteristics, we know uh, what are the operating points and we will have to uh, do the prototype design and get the load characteristics and what is the motor operating points. And then we may have to fine tune our motors accordingly in order to achieve that particular operating point. So having this information is very uh, critical to design an efficient system. Hope, uh, sir, one more question, sir. Yeah. If you are, we have already the standard of US, uh, cycle, uh, US have some standard cycle is there. Japan is having some standard cycle for IC engines. Yeah. Any standard system is like that, uh, having that uh, electrical vehicle is there now? No, electric vehicles as such do not have a separate drive cycles. We are following whatever is available for IC engines for that particular region. But your question is right and valid. For electric vehicles, we have to think about having a different uh, duty cycles and high cycles because the characteristics of this machine is totally different from IC engines and we can have a better uh, uh, better dry cycles as well. So that is not updated or there is no such thing available right now for electric. Okay, thank you, sir. One more thing. If you are uh, the driving cycle to varying according, for example, you are using the induction motor or a DC motor, the what way they suitable for good for heavy in the urban area or uh, rural area? For example, if you, the motor is different, uh, for example, Tesla using the induction motor nowadays, some other uh, electrical vehicle uh, wearing the DC motors, but how it will be driving cycle to correlate this type of things? Okay, so dry cycle correlating with the type of machine, I don't think we can really do that. Is, is that what your question? Uh, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. So it's, uh, I don't think we can straight away do that. So what we need to do in uh, design, uh, design is we need to have, what is the requirement of the vehicle? What is the operating point? We need to understand the load characteristics in order to start designing a motor. So once you know that, then accordingly, you can either for this particular, uh, uh, for example, this is my load characteristics. I can get a permanent magnetic, uh, uh, you know, plot like this, an induction machine with a different one. So, factors for choosing either induction machine or permanent magnet machine may not be really completely depending upon the dry cycle. It may be completely different because in permanent magnet machines, you have to have other factors such as the cost, weight, and other things that are playing a major factor in the supply chain as well. And of course, when compared to reliability, uh, permanent magnet machines, when compared to induction machine, induction machines are better. So I can choose induction machine, I can choose permanent magnet machine, but selecting that uh, may or may not have a direct relation. That's what I can, I can think of. Okay. 
Thank you, there sir. Are Thank you. There other factors that will be that will be governing uh, selection of an induction machine or an or a permanent magnetic machine, not just the drive cycle operating points. Hope I have answered the question, uh, or you have any other point? Someone from Josna Jos had a question in the chat. Tesla is actually they want to technology barrier or, or breaker. I would say they they just they just go in the opposite direction. Never uh, sorry, diesel engines or petrol engines they want to you know do for. Uh, If you look at uh, the way uh, Tesla is uh, analyzing the future, the two things they're actually looking at uh, Tesla. One is the availability of the is a rare material, and another one is the permanent magnet lithium. Neolium. So these are very again permanent. These are very rare earth metals which are not available in the in the uh, yeah on the it's not available. We just wanted to ensure that they they address this issue by taking with induction machine. Apart from apart from the comp element is better. Efficiency is little bit less. They have very good. Uh, efficient algorithms, which uh, in, in other ways, be it the cooling system, be it the load that the auxiliary loads that they consume. Because these are all widely available, these materials are available, copper, and then you have some iron core and all these are being used in an induction machine. So they are widely available, and that's why uh, Tesla is actually preferring to go with induction machines. As I DC motor, DC motor, DC motor, DC motor is uh, again uh, the challenge is with uh, maintenance. So you need to have a proper maintenance. You can go for brushless again. Brushless is cannot go for higher power. I think. No, the control is good for. I mean, the controllability is good for DC machines. Uh, these are certain uh, realistic challenges because these machines will be subjected to dirt, dust, and the inside, uh, just below the hood, and then they are subjected to various types of uh, foreign objects, and that will actually create a problem over a period of time in terms of maintenance, and that's the major reason for going ahead with uh, AC motors. Any other questions or we can close for the day? Why peak torque is important in uh, EV? So, this is because of the motor, this is not because of anything else. Unlike an engine, engine you don't have a separate peak torque or a nominal torque or anything. It's just only one car. They don't have this uh, overloading capability, and that's what is very much important. Let us say uh, peak torque uh, will be required load-wise. When I talk about load-wise, peak torque would be required when uh, uh, you are having a full weight. Let's say GBW is full, and then you are climbing a hill. You need a heavy torque, 
and for that torque the engine has to be sized in the ic engine engine has to be sized for that particular peak torque requirement but here uh, you need to size uh, for the peak torque continuous power because uh, peak torque is only available or the load requirement is only for few seconds so you don't let's say 1000 in the vehicle from at that particular operating condition in the engine you have to size you have since your the motor can be overloaded for a short duration of time you can select a find and your for a brief duration and then once the motor uh, rotates and the vehicle starts moving the torque requirement load torque requirement will come down so thereby this is peak torque important